like in social work, you learn two things. One, relationships are everything. And two, to trust the process. And so yes. I'm just having this massive trust of, of this vision and this massive trust of I know people well enough and skill people skills well enough to yeah. combat any anything that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's what relationship skills give you is the ability to, to navigate anything, anything Mm -hmm. life has to throw at us. We can navigate through relationship, healthy relationship skills. Welcome to the relational parenting podcast. I'm Jennifer Hayes, a parent coach and 20 year childcare veteran. Each week, I sit down with my own father, Rick Hayes, and discuss the complicated issues that parents face today, as well as some of the oldest questions in the book. From the latest research and the framework of my relational parenting method, we offer thought-provoking solutions to your deepest parenting struggles. Added bonuses include intergenerational wounding discussions and guest childcare experts. We will also start taking your parenting questions in episode five. So be sure to comment with your biggest questions or email me directly at Jenny at JennyB.co. Let's get started. Welcome back, everybody, to the Relational Parenting Podcast. We are here <laughs> with my friend Emily Blake. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hi, yeah. Emily. We are so excited to have you. Um, ever since you and I spoke earlier this year, I have just, I just, have, you're just so innovative, and I love what you're doing um, as a single mom and um, the the community that you're creating for other single moms, um, so that you don't have to single parent anymore. You can co-parent with other. Yeah other women. Um, it's absolutely amazing. And now you are actually launching like the full blown community service. Uh, and, and let's see, you're calling it Kintopia. Yeah. Cool. Yes. So are you excited? (laughs) Started as, um, as an experiment, right. Um, in 2018, I had my son and became a single mom. I never really wanted to be a single mom. Like, I don't think that's something anybody ever sets out to do. Um, Right. (laughs) I I was also raised by a single mom and I deeply recognized like all of the, the challenges that we had as a family. And so I really took the time to be like, you know what, I'm, I'm really great at a few things. I'm a social worker and I'm really amazing at cultivating, creating community. And if I'm going through these single parenting challenges with, with now a baby um, and also these housing challenges, then I can't be the only mom that's only single parent that's going through this. Right. And so I thought, could I, I started, um, this co-living idea as a experiment. Could I create a community where we would yeah. we could all come together and really support and help each other? And the resounding response over four years is absolutely yes. This is highly cool. needed and we continually have a wait list. And so, like you mentioned, I'm launching Kintopia to create more co-living communities for, you know, the non-typical families. Um and I've cultivated enough uh, experience over the past four years to know what works really, really well in co-living and to ask, you know, the right kind of interview questions to find uh, the best kind of pairs for, for co-living success. Yeah. So what are, what are some so, of the things that you, that are part of your interview question checklist of like pairing yourself because you you yourself uh live in a co-living situation correct um so what are some of the questions um that you that you ask to make sure people are kosher and and match up for living together and parenting together because that's hard enough to find in part committed romantic partners (laughs) let alone strangers right yes um, and yeah. so most mom mom unions or um, co-living situations, it's usually friends that decide, you know, we've known each other for a long time. We trust each other. Our kids like each other. Let's let's move in. Let's let's cohabitate and make life better as a result of community. Um, so Utopia is different in that you're meeting basically strangers, but I call them future friends, future mommies. <laughs> um, yeah. And what I've, what I've learned that works really, really well is 
okay, so when I first started this in 2018 or 2019, I was like, anybody that wants to co-live, come live. And then over that period of time, I've learned um, there's definitely, I've had like hard learned lessons around what works and what doesn't work. So if you're Mm -hmm. just looking to co-living to save money, it ultimately will not work. You have to look to co-living for community. And the definition of community is what you put in, is what you can expect to get out. It is the cyclical, giving, loving type of a relationship, right? And if people are coming to community just expecting to take from community, it won't work. Um, If people are coming to community um, and just always giving, it won't work either. It is this cyclical give-take relationships. Um, the other thing that we're, that I've learned, um, with co-living with littles, co-living with kids, it's one thing to just Mm -hmm. have roommates and like come up with systems for, you know, cleaning, but it's another thing when you have kids. And so the kid aspect means, um, you have to have similar parenting styles. So like, Mm -hmm. I don't yell at my son. So I learned, you know, that that's really important to me when another mom yelled at my son and I was like, Ooh, Oh no, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) Great voices. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, um, like I'm very mindful in like my discipline style. Um, and like, I deeply believe, you know, about breaking generational curses so that our kids are not raised by like the traumas that raised us, you know? And so yeah. I've done deep healing work in myself and I really support that for other, uh, other moms. And, um, I don't, I don't yell at him. I don't spank him. Um, and, there have been, you know, definite moments where, and this is also where I love about co-living is because in, I co-live with two other single moms. And so I'm able to tell them like the highest vision of my, of who I want to be as a mom. And then what's nice mm. is they can hold me accountable for that. The moments where I'm not being my best. Self. <laughs> I just had a hard day and the moms are being like, Hey, Em, you go take a break. You know, we got Jaden for a little bit. And I'm like, because like you know, there are those <laughs> moments like we have who we want to be and then we have the hard days when everything's mm-hmm. hitting the fan and we're not our best selves and I'm not coming to parenting as my best self I'm coming as you know tired worn out you know I have a you know I'm do Kintopia but I also do grant writing uh consulting full-time and so when I have like a ton of clients a, lo- a long day and I'm not coming to parenting as my best self it really helps to have partners in this co- co-living and co-parenting journey where yeah. you know if I'm at like 15 percent maybe they're at 50 maybe they're at 60 and then together we have much closer to 100 percent that we can all share yes. and, and help I love that. That's so, that's so important in any living situation, um, to, I talked maybe a couple of episodes ago about how my husband and I do, we do the percentage system where we share if he's coming home from work or I'm coming home from work or we're, you know, whatever, we're, we're having our reunion of the day. Um, we always let each other know, not always, but usually, uh, where we're at percentage wise so that the other person knows what to expect, um, energetically and what that person needs. Um, you know, there's days he comes home and I can jump on him and tell him, you know, chatterbox about my day. And there's days that he's like, I'm at zero. I need very, like quiet. He's a nurse. So he mm-hmm. just hears beeping in his head all day. And he's just like, I just need silence. Um, so that I can prepare myself to not jump on him and, and unload and, and all of those things. And I think that that's, I love that you use that system. Um, I also love that you guys are using, like you're holding each other accountable. That's really hard to do. That's really hard to be receptive to, um, is that reflection from other people. Um, and it really only works if you've like verbalized it out loud in an agreement together to say, Hey, like Mm -hmm. we all want to be the best parent that we can be. Um, and I'm willing to accept your feedback when I am not fulfilling that promise to myself or to my child. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it sounds like you guys aren't like, it sounds like you're doing it in, in a, in a loving way, you know, the way that you parent your children is reflected in the way that you talk to each other when it's like, Hey, you know, your, your roommates, your mom mates aren't like, Emily, dude, chill, like calm down. You're being a jerk to your kid right now. They're like, Hey, 
you know, it sounds like you've had a really hard day. Like, why don't you go take care of yourself, take a bath or whatever? Like we've got Jaden, everything's cool here. Like, like go take care of yourself. Like we're here for you. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. It's, it's much. So, um, in the interview process, we talk about like the systems and, um, our communication styles, what works really well for us. Um, and one of my goals is to, is to have that level of accountability to, to ask, you know, the, um, the mom mates, you know, this is, this is something that is important to me around being a parent. Um, is this something that you're, you know, open to? And nine times out of 10, people are super open to the growth level of parenting. There are two things in life that have made me a better person. It's mm-hmm. definitely parenting and entrepreneurship. Like each of these challenges have made me grow yes. as a person so much that, you know, it's, yes. and I, I think I find the people uh, that are also really interested in, um, you know, becoming the best versions of ourselves, becoming um, better for our kids, putting our kids in a better uh, path than we might've had ourselves, having our kids have like really empowering, loving journeys. I told one of the moms yesterday, I was like, I'm on this mission in entrepreneurship so that Jaden never knows what an overdraft fee is. You know, like I want to make sure that he, Mm. um, you know, like I, how many times I've had overdraft fees that just, you know, have like made me like paralyzed or I'm just like, Oh, I want to call the bank and try to negotiate this overdraft. Are these like nine overdraft fees that hit and you know, I'm just like, I never want Jaden to experience that. I want him to experience like the fullness of life and really um, setting him up in like an entrepreneurial j- journey early on. So he knows like this recipro- reciprocal relationship around the energy that you give and how, m- how much you help other people is what you, the currency of life. And you can expect that back. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to meet other single moms that are interested in, you know, kind of these growth, like personal, professional growth, entrepreneurship and, um, and co-parenting journeys. And I deeply believe that in community, um, we become better. We're, we're better as a result. So like Kintopia, the name of Kintopia came as a result. I did a 60 second documentary and one of the comments, the mom said, oh, this is like a momtopia. And I was like, yeah, but mm. I don't want to limit it to just moms. There was a time when like I couldn't, during the pandemic, I couldn't mm. find a mom and a single dad was like, I know this is just for, this typically has just been for moms, but would you be open to a single dad? And at the time I was a little bit desperate and I was like, sure. Um, and it actually worked out really beautiful. Yeah. It was actually really wonderful. My son, you know, is typically around so many women from at, um, at school and, um, and here, and so I was like, it was really nice having yes. <clears throat> having a father figure that Jaden. And also, I don't want I don't want to play fight. So when my five year old comes and like jumps on me, I'm like, no, absolutely not. Bud. But the dad was <laughs> play fighting and like around and beating him up with pillows. And I was like, oh my god, thank you, I needed this. So I love the idea of yeah. I, I chose Kintopia for the idea of like unconventional families, whether you're a single mom or dad, whether you're a grandma raising kids, um, raising your grandkids, like whatever your unconventional family looks like, it can be made better in community. So I love love that. The, Um, uh, the, uh, there's so many parallels to what you're doing that would be healthy in conventional families. I I thank you for using that word conventional. You know, it wouldn't hurt conventional families to do a lot of this talking about parenting styles, you know, all the screening that you do. Really, everybody needs to do that. The accountability, the the growth mindset, Mm -hmm. you know, these are all so important in in, uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I got to caution you about Jaden and the overdrafts, though. Some kids, you know, they got to learn how to manage money. That's a that's a great hope. Um, But uh, boy, you can always spend more than you have. (laughs) How old's Jaden? Jaden uh, is five, so he just started kindergarten. And is five? 
he's been struggling yeah. with kindergarten too. So that's a whole new transition. So having other moms, yeah. my roommates, her um, her son is eight. And so she's like, oh yeah, I've been been through this transition. Um, I'm working with like the school yeah. to advocate my son get on an IEP. And so navigating that. And so she's been able to help me like, you know, guide me with that, some of that. And so it's, it's really made like parenting nicer. And so I think that the fear that comes up that people have is, um, you know, just the unknown of like, I don't know how this other person parents or, um, you know, it actually like living with other women, that sounds terrible. Yeah. And that, that feedback before. Um, and the idea of like, not just kin, like meaning family, but kinship, right? Like this idea that like, if we have no, like Mother Teresa said, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other, right? And so our, our yeah. definition yeah. is, it's reflecting this unshakable, innate goodness within the human family, like this deep abiding care and love and, um, and compassion that we can have for each other. And when you enter an agreement with that, at the forefront, that's the, that's the goal. Um, it lets in grace and forgiveness and, um, openness for, you know, like the mishaps that are bound to happen. Because I, the other thing I've known as a social worker is we are all our complete selves and then life, we bump, we bump up against each other. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever read, read, uh, read the four agreements, but the one agreement that you, mm-hmm. you, you just, you can't take anything personal. Like it's not about everybody's mm-hmm. navigating this world in their own world. And so when you're bumping up against each other, yeah. um, the other thing that I've, I lay out uh, in the community is like systems and processes for open and clear communication that we are not mind readers, that we have to um, express ourselves and express mm-hmm. what, you know, what little thing is getting on our nerves that becomes a big thing if you don't talk about it. Right. And so having regular, yeah. we have weekly family dinners. Um, and then we have, um, we also do like, uh, monthly like spa days and regular like meetings without the kids. So getting a sitter and then the moms just get together and can talk about, you know, what's going really well, what's not going as well. And communication becomes such a key element of successful co-living and, but you have to build it in. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, I mean, you're literally bringing in people and or counseling people, um, on healthy relationship skills. Like you're, you're literally bringing people in, you're discussing how to communicate, how to like, like you're talking about a growth mindset. You're talking about people who are willing and like open to give reflection and receive reflection who are not going to take things personally, who can step up when one parent is struggling. Um, like you're, you're, and then you're, you know, you specifically are talking about your parenting style and, and, you know, the things that are non-negotiables for you, like yelling and, and hitting and things like that. And so like, you're literally creating communities and build, like helping other people build relationships. And you're also attracting people who are interested in really healthy relationships, um, and living in peace and growth together. Um, and so not only are you facilitating help and community for parents who are on their own and struggling, but you're also facilitating children growing up in an environment full of healthy relationship examples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More than just one, hopefully, you know, the the primary relationship, but developing that extended family or that kinship, you know, that close family relationship with people in the community. You have so many, you have so so many more resources, so many skill sets, so many points of view um, Mm -hmm. to draw on that. That sounds like, uh, that really kind of sounds old timey where the, the family homestead is, you know, everybody's near one another, everybody, there's a lot of family nearby. That sounds, uh, that sounds incredibly helpful in this day and age. Yeah. Thank you. People have told me like, Oh, you're, um, I'm such an optimist, right? Like even in the work that I do with grant writing, um, <laughs> writing for, and like writing, like creating funds for 
like ending systems of oppression and creating systems of care. I deeply believe that communities like this, Mm -hmm. Adrian Marie Brown calls them fractals, right? They become fractals of what's possible for the collective. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other reason why I started, I wanted to crowdfund for Kintopia is to create more fractals, more proof points that this, you know, utopia of, uh, of kinship is really possible for all human families and making sure that you have the, um, the tools and resources and support ready. Um, that's like a built in system within a home, um, that then we can also extrapolate to, you know, in systems of oppression, like mass incarceration and create more systems of care, support, mm-hmm. love that end up having a much greater return on investment and um, much greater, like care beats any s- system of harm or oppression hands down. And I deeply believe we are at this mm-hmm. unique piss in you know human history where we are going to start seeing a shift towards care i, I think you're right i think yeah. you're right there's a there's a social evolution while you were describing that the word social evolution came to mind you know as society gets more fragmented you're putting out you're you're being a little a uh, little core i like the word fractal too uh, little pieces of dna out that are now out in the out in the gene pool you know that can be recombined we're figuring out society is figuring out how to move forward you know with the with the uh, digital the social media with all the things that have fragmented us uh, in, mm-hmm. la- in recent decades, you know, you, you seem to be on the forefront of uh, figuring out a better way forward through that. That's really good to see. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I think the next iteration of society that we create is going to center community, collaboration, connection, um, our innate human goodness. Um, and I'm excited to... Yeah. Um, support showing fractals of spaces that it's happening and possible. Yeah. And you're really, you're really setting up these fractals. Um, you're, you're not just like creating it and, and being like, okay, good luck. You're really, it sounds like you have (laughs) systems in place where you're setting everybody up for success. And I, I live in the community too. So like I benefit by with the systems and processes and one of my greatest, um, two yeah. of my greatest values are peace and joy. Like in my home, I want to also have peace mm-hmm. and have an abundance of joy. And so these systems and setting up so that I can live yeah. my best life. And I'm also, I love community. It's another key value of mine. And so I'm, I literally mm-hmm. get to live my bliss in, uh, you know, in a shared living, co-living environment. And I want to share that with others with Kintopia. Yeah. I love it. It's such an Fantastic. amazing project. And you've been working on this since 2018. Is that correct? Or at least this has been a, an idea for you since 2018. Yeah. So I had my son in 28, uh, April, 28, 2018, um, and then at the time I was, um, I was living with a, a friend and a roommate and it ultimately just didn't work out. Cause you know, in theory, people are like, yeah, babies are great. But then when the baby is actually crying at three o'clock in the morning and you have to get up and manage a restaurant, my roommate managed a restaurant in Culver city. So she was just like, you know what, in theory, this, this was huh. beautiful. And in practice, it's just not going to work. And so I was yeah. in the challenge. I had, I faced, so, this house also came out of an experience of, I've always had roommates in Los Angeles. And after I had my son, I experienced so much housing discrimination because, oh, people don't want to live with, with uh, you know, other kids that aren't theirs. And, you know, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. mind blown. Like, mm-hmm. better, better. Let me figure out, you know, does, would this, this, this house also started as an experiment of would other single moms want to live with kids that aren't theirs? And the yeah. response has been a resounding, absolutely. Like, yes, sign us up. Um, and then um, the practice of it. So this, the I wasn't able to actually get the house. So it's a two bedroom, sorry, a five bedroom, two bathroom, two story house near downtown LA. Um, and the way that I secured the house was around um, 
in the summer of 2019. Um, and so in the beginning I was like, I posted to, to Facebook and I was, I was basically like any single moms, like let's do this. And there were crickets at first. It was like, Oh, nobody's, nobody's going to come co-live with me. How am I going to pay all this rent? Yeah. <laughs> like it was it's pretty expensive. Yeah. And so I was like, Oh no. And then I just kept like, one of the things that I can credit to myself is, um, I'm a powerful like innovator and like, um, I just don't give up. So I was starting to post it online and then I was like, okay, let me post it to these other groups. And then by talking to different people, they told me about other like co-abode, co-abode.com. And so that like, it's literally a site for moms to connect. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm not the first person that created this. Of course not. Like nothing's new under the sun. I may be mm-hmm. one of the first yeah. try to formulate it so that it's actually like there's a lot of co-living communities but they typically fo- focus on like the entertainment industry or like young younger people or you know older people with like mm-hmm. um co-living for like retirement folks but there's no real yeah. co-living communities for families um and there, the ones are, that are yeah. out there very very expensive and so the goal with Kentopia is to make it mm somewhat affordable and, um, and put a lot of like, uh, safeguards and processes and systems in place so that the relationships are really centered. And that's what makes it, you know, relationships and community and, and kinship is really centered. And that's what makes it work. Yeah. So do you, if there's, um, a, if there's ever a dispute that a co-living, you know, not in your, in your home, but in, but in another area, um, if there's ever a dispute or a disagreement or maybe two families or, or three families feel like they're a great fit and they move in together and, but things just aren't going well, what's kind of your, like, do you help them work through that? Do you help them, um, you know, kind of relocate? Uh, what is the process for, um, you know, some of the very natural things that may come up as far as conflict or, um, things not working out? That's a great question. And in four years of doing this, it absolutely has come up here, um, where, you know, maybe I said something that really rubbed someone the wrong way, or, you know, um, yeah. maybe I wasn't involved, but it was between the other two roommates. And so they, they almost needed like a mediator. Right. Um, and so how we've handled yeah. it is very much like, I anticipate and expect that people are going to have conflict. We're humans. Like it's a part of human relationships yeah. that conflict comes up. One of the things, so I'm a social worker and I've practiced restorative justice for the past 15 years. And in restorative justice, transformational justice, it talks about like the repairing the harm and coming full circle back around to like center the relationship, center, um, make amends that, yes, I recognize that there was this harm that was done. And then you come back around to, Mm. you know, make amends. And that amends can look different depending on the circumstance. Um, And so, some of these yeah. things are agreements that are set up in the very beginning around, you know, these understandings that like we are human, we, you know, hope for the best and we're going to be prepared that if we do have a conflict, that there is, you know, uh, processes in place that we will resolve conflict and resolve resolve conflict quickly and ultimately um resolving the conflict with the respect of the dignity and value of every person involved. So everybody has a chance to be heard. Every person has a chance to, and these are also, I also, okay, I nerd out about conflict a little bit because it's also a growth opportunity. Like we bump up against each other because someone is touching a trigger point for, of mm-hmm. ours. And when, when, a, when an unknown yeah. trigger point comes up, I love it. And it's like, oh, here's an opportunity for us to grow. Here's an opportunity for us to like, and this is why it's also really important. I found in uh, interviewing moms that the the best fit moms are the ones that really best fit community members, moms, grandmas, uh, uncles, 
you know, um, even I've even had a um, a mom move or not a mom, a roommate moved in and she was like, I'll just be the rich auntie. I was like, yes, we need rich aunties too. So but the best <laughs> community members are the ones right. that. Um, You're like, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, they, All the traditional roles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that are really open to this growth mindset, this um, recognizing like none of us are perfect people. We all have our stuff. We all have our baggage that we're carrying. And are we willing to, you know, look at our muck, look at our ugly sides and say, this is something that I'm, mm. I'm working on because I'm so focused on becoming this highest version of myself. And, you know, with so many relationships around, you're, you're, it's also like a gift to be able to work on yourself. And then the other thing that I've thought about, um, so currently like, um, I've been renting to own the house with the company and I'm the only one on the lease and, um, that's a lot of pressure. And so I, um, with Kintopia, I'm creating a model where everybody's on the lease and everybody has shared benefit of renting, right. That creates this, you know, ultimately relationships are a lot of work. And for people to be invested in doing the work, they have to be incentivized. And so um, I'm, I'm working on creating a model in which you're, instead of just your down payment or your, you know, first month uh, rent, last month rent, going just towards um, rent and going to the landlord, um, it's, I'm going to create a bank for like a, um, a rent to buy type program. So you create a bank and when you move out, you get this bank to, you know, buy a house and maybe, you know, you and a couple of other single moms really enjoyed co-living with each other. Here's an opportunity for you guys to uh, create an agreement and buy a home together if things really worked out the way that, you know, if you guys wow. really found people that they liked. Um, I also have this vision. So I'm working as a grant writer and I'm, I'm working with an architect right now. And she was just like, I was kind of like, before we started doing more of the grant writing stuff, I was kind of complaining about, you know, I'm looking at a bunch of different places for other Kintopias. And the issue always comes up that, you know, there's one opulent master bedroom and then the rest of the rooms are kind of like, meh, you know? Um, and so yeah. for yeah. Yeah. you to really work, you want each of the moms to have their own like mama suite, you know, where you have a, uh, a master type, type sweet uh, bedroom and like a walk-in closet and a, you know, like an opulent soap tub yeah. for you to like really relax, you know? And so I was telling um, my architect uh, friend that I'm writing or a uh, client that I'm writing a grant for, and she was just like, why don't you build that? And I was like, wait, what? And she was like, yeah, you can get a, mm. a home and, you know, I'll help you design it. And that that's something you can build. And I was like, Oh, so that happened over the summer and that epiphany was like, oh, wow, I really do need to create Kintopia and create co-living spaces where each mom feels like we're thriving. Like you're, you, you get to live in your opulence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Another evolution. I love that. I love you talk about the, and then the also restitution. Having like All these shared playroom, having each of the, um, you know, kids rooms, like, you know, having uh younger. So I've also learned yeah. in the living, having the younger kids be able to like have a room together and having the older kids have a room together and then separating it by gender. So like, you know, younger girls, younger boys, um, older, older girls, older boys. Um, and then having like a massive like play area, having, um, you know, huge beautiful kitchen and then the idea okay so if i'm gonna do like a luxury option of kintopia when i really start to play with the idea i'm like hey then we can hire a nanny with like if there's seven moms yeah. seven to ten mm-hmm. moms together the cost of like you know two nannies becomes doable across seven to ten of us you know and then um the cost of you know like a chef the cost of you know when i think about like what would our most opulent lives look like? And the days that I've <laughs> lost it on Jaden are the days that I didn't have any support. You know, I didn't have yeah. another mom there to like help me help him with his homework, get dinner on the table, uh, finish all my client work and make sure that he gets in bed. And then I'm able to wake up at five 30 to get him to the you know bus at 6am the next morning. Like, 
we all need a little help. And so it's nice to be able to like, yeah. you know, come together and then we can collectively afford these services and we can collectively afford the support because it's one thing to rotate, you know, uh, babysitting. And it's another thing to, you know, hire a babysitter so that we all get a break. And so I want to be able to cost that out and right. include that in some of like maybe the luxury options of the Kintopia of the future. I was just going to say, like, you could even, like, I was just, I was thinking, like, in within the community, whether it's two or three moms and or dads or seven to ten, like, there's shit that you can, you can rotate who's babysitting or who's got the kids. And so everybody gets a night out or a, or a night off to just, like, oh. be alone or something, you know. Um, but how, how much, like even better would it be to pool resources and like hire a nanny? Um, you know, if, if you're getting, I mean, in LA, I bet, I bet a good nanny costs a minimum of 30 bucks an hour. Um, and if that can be a $10 an hour thing split three ways or split seven ways, it's like $3 an hour. Like how much more affordable and how much more often could you do that and have, like feel as a parent, like I, I get a regular break, not just yeah. like once in a while, mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. I can possibly scrape it in. But like we have built in, you know, twice a month, we all, we hire a nanny and we all get to do our own thing for exactly. the night or the day or whatever. Like, and, and then you get to come back as like your cup is now full as a parent and you can be a f- like you can now pour from a full cup for your children. Exactly. And this idea of very uh, interesting. I really want everybody to like live their, their, their highest visions for their life. And so I've met some moms that only want to be homemakers. And so I've met some moms that actually mm-hmm. stayed in toxic relationships because they didn't have the economic viability to move out and be on their own. Right. And, mm-hmm. and to I'm thinking of in particular, both of them were just like, I love being a homemaker. That's all I want to do. And I'm like, that's great. The in every Kentopia is going to need that, you know? Um, because yeah. Yeah. I, love, yeah. I love working. I've worked since I was 14. I love what I do. I love the gifts that I get to share with clients. I don't want to be a homemaker, but I definitely yeah. like value and know that we need more moms like that. And so I also see Quintopia as, um, you know, domestic violence survivors being able to leave really toxic, harmful, harmful Mm. uh, situations and being like, okay, I'm going to apply for, you know, being the Quintopia um, um, like nanny. And, you know, you get to, I'm very big on like, Mm. you bring their kids um, and they would get it. It would be a job for them but it would also be um, home. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that also creates such a yeah. synergy around like, wow, we get to, we do get to, you know, live our best lives, live our bliss. Yeah, if this. you had a collection of seven or 10 people, then there's a lot of room for roles. There's all kinds of yeah. niches yeah. to be, to, uh, for, so, for people to participate in that in different ways. Really, That's a great idea. Totally. Well, even like you were saying, like the, the single dad that you lived with who came in and would wrestle with Jaden, um, and fill that role that you were like, not, you're like, I'm not going to wrestle with you. (laughs) Um, there's absolutely not. (laughs) I'm like, bud, stop climbing on me. I really don't like it. (laughs) Right. Right. And there's, and there's, there's so much value too in, in, kids growing up with people with healthy role models and trusted adults, um, who fill different roles so that they get to see the array of differences Mm -hmm. in people and how people are come together and work together as a team. And there's different strengths and weaknesses and the kids learn that they can go to different adults for different questions or things that need fulfilled. Maybe like you're terrible at math and Jaden's going to need help with math homework. And there's a parent in the house who is great at math. Like, cool. Like you help my kid with math. I'll help yours with English or whatever, you know? Diversity is good. 
you know, that's, different genders, different skill sets. Yeah, that's that's a terrific yeah. uh, model. And the one thing, so when people say, oh, you're living with that many people, it must be that scary. When you have a space that's big enough, like I currently live in, the, in a five bedroom, two bathroom house that has two living, uh, well, a living room and let's say like a den. Um, and uh, we have this mm. shared office space. Um, and then um, I, I only, I share it with three other single moms. So each mom has uh, their own room. The kids have a shared kids room. Uh, currently we all live with boys that are under the age of eight. So it works out. And then, um, but ultimately like if, it, if kids are younger, gender wise, they, 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 it's been fine to share rooms. But as I had, one, I learned yeah. from living with a, an 11 year old girl. And then we had two younger boys that it would have been nice for her to have her own room, you know? And so I'm thinking about all of these yeah. Yeah, what puberty is that I've had over the past four years and then intentionally creating, and that's going to be the biggest difference is this crowdfunding campaign is to intentionally create um, a co-living community that is spacious and big and has this nice big kitchen and has like lots of different gathering spaces for us and is, you know, four stories, you know, tall and has a basement playground and, you know, I'm yeah. getting super creative and I'm also super open to like other ideas. So if any listeners are like, we love this and we have thoughts, send them my way. Yeah. In other cities, like, cause, cause I think you mentioned earlier in the conversation, you're looking at other locations for doing this. Yeah. Are you, are you looking outside of LA? You know, like, like if you were to expand your wildest dreams, you know, setting up Kentopias in all over the U S in different yeah, cities. I can see Although, this being huge. I've been, I've been consulting with single moms um, to to create like this is Kintopia is the first iteration of um, us uh, acquiring property and and building more homes like this. But prior to, to this, yeah. Kintopia, I was doing more consulting with single moms to create their own uh, co-living communities and like using all of my, um, you know, templates for leases and interview questions and whatnot. And so um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I've had moms that are, uh, that are doing this in, that I've helped consult in Portland, in the Bay area, in Seattle um, and in New York. And I would love for there to be Kintopias literally all over the world. I think it would be also such a beautiful yeah. Uh, way to bring about the idea of like, you know, kinship, like, and I am deeply, I love the idea of um, raising my son as a global citizen, right? And so no better way to do that than have Kintopias everywhere. Yeah, the yeah. diversity helps. I can see, I can see a, a cooperative, I'm no business guy, but, but, uh, or if you could get this uh, going in areas that uh, were a a uh, DCFS or, you know, some kind of pub already existing set of services would uh, mm. lead the way and provide resources to them, mm. you know, would help you, would help that spread because it's a need that's everywhere in the yeah. country now. The trick is how to, how to roll it out and finance the property. And it, it requires something, all these things you were saying, it requires somebody who's lived in it. Or, you know, there, there are certain skills to get it started up. A lot of single mothers, a lot of individuals are not going to be prepared to do mm -hmm. what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, and to take that on. Some way to facilitate that from afar, uh, consulting or something. There's just all, that's a, that's a great idea. That fits such a need in society. And, and I, I wish you all the best in figuring out how, how to get that all over the country. That sounds really exciting. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned, um, you know, organizations and departments like DCFS, right? Um, so many times single moms, we are, um, you know, put in the position to have these systems be in our lives. Sometimes the systems can be supportive and maybe give us access yeah. to resources and support, but nine times out of 10, they are not supportive. They are harmful and they don't, yeah. you know, yeah. they don't end up, and I'm a social worker, right? Like I, I, I deeply believe that we need social work. We need social workers to keep kids safe. And we also need social workers to have more resources dedicated towards making sure that kids stay with the exactly. parents and resources to take kids out of homes. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, exactly. I think we cultivate um, 
so this is my idea for like structure. I love that you mentioned business stuff. So I'm super, I'm a super nerd when it comes to business stuff. And so I've consulted with like nonprofit and for-profit clients for grants. And I get questions about Kintopia. Well, how are you structuring it? Is it going to be a nonprofit? Is it going to be a for-profit? And I'm yeah. really interested in the ideas of um, hybrid models, right? And before 2012, um, there didn't exist a... Um, like this, uh, 2012, we saw the benefit corporation rise, right? Which is, you can now have a corporation, but it can have a triple bottom line of people, planet, profits. Um, and so I would open it as a benefit corporation. And then I'm also thinking about the nonprofit side of doing programming for moms, right? Like the spa days, the, um, the, you know, financial investing courses. So you're living here, but you're taking these financial investing courses, these home buying courses to set you up for becoming a homeowner yourself. I'm deeply mm -hmm. committed to mm -hmm. leverage, mm -hmm. leverage Kintopia to make sure that more single parents not only exit out of poverty, but leave a, a legacy of generational wealth for our kids. Um, I no longer, having been raised by a single mom myself, I no longer want moms to moms or single dads or you know grandmas that are raising their grandkids to struggle yeah. i don't want that to be our you know the uniqueness yeah. of our families means that we have to live in struggle i think kintopia can be yeah. a vehicle for collective thriving and collective wealth and generational wealth building i agree i agree it's a way out of this uh the mess we've got ourselves in with raising kids and, and mm -hmm. broken families and you're you're creating you've mentioned this word a couple of times and I really want to highlight the longevity of what you're doing and you've related that to your restorative justice work um in the past and I think that you are carrying that torch forward with this and serving a population that um has maybe been overlooked for it I think that there's a lot of um there are government resources. There, are, there are you know uh, women's shelters for domestic abuse sufferers, and there are um, there are some social services in place for very specific uh, populations. But one, they're always overcrowded. There's never enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and two, like you said, they're not always really truly in service to thriving. Um, and it's, it's more about like, we've got to check the boxes. We've got to get these, you know, people processed and things in and then out. And, um, it's still, they're still usually living, living in some level of poverty. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've worked, I did it. I've done some social work, um, with adults with disabilities for a few years. I worked for an agency. Um, I've worked with foster children and I've worked, um, for a couple of years with, uh, kids in juvenile detention centers, um, mm -hmm. and learned a lot. I also took some restorative justice, criminal justice in uh, college, actually, now that I'm, I, that memory just flashed. Um, <laughs> um, but talking about how the systems of punishment, right. Locking people up, punishing people, um, you know, and I'm not advocating for letting murderers and, you know, rapists and terrible people run free, but there is, you know, there are so many levels of mistakes that can be made, um, or situations that kids especially are born into, um, mm -hmm. and repeat cycles because they don't know any better. Like, it, mm -hmm. you know, they've been, they were literally just born into it and that's all they know. And that's all they see. And the way to break that cycle is to teach them a different way, not to continue the cycle with punishment, shame, guilt, um, all of these things, but to actually help them heal, show mm -hmm. them a different way. Um, and I feel like that, and, and that's that type of rehabilitation they've, they've shown that that actually transforms people, um, mm -hmm. and helps them change their lives for the better for long periods of time versus, um, mm -hmm. recidivism rates, which are still just insanely high people who get out of prison or out of detention centers or whatever, like they reoffend. I think the last statistic I saw was 93% reoffend. Yeah. I don't it's know if that's still out. accurate, but 
in certain places. Re- sure. Rehabilitation and teaching healthy habits and and like real skills, real life skills is always going to trump um, just the processing of systems just to say that we checked the box and did the thing. Mm-hmm. And the return on investment. So how much it costs to incarcerate yeah. a child in this country right? is enormous. Um, it's, a it's, it's a business. It's a business. It's a business and it um, it creates an economy, right? Like yeah. You, you yeah. Know, because you have these jails, you have these prisons. Now you need the uh, more in the 1970s. They were they there were political scientists that were saying we're not going to need prisons soon enough. And then we had yeah. mass incarceration and the drug uh, prohibition and all the yeah. Yeah. Uh, all these manufactured uh like war on drugs Crimes. right and, <laughs> some, some would argue like, that was a racism know, thing like there's too. been a, yeah. a criminal like um blow up of what what we can what is considered like in a penal code today that could you uh, you can get incarcerated for wasn't considered a crime in the 1970s there's all yeah. these things that like now that we have it um i like to talk about the prison industrial complex oh, it operates like a hotel. So now yeah. that you have the beds, you fill the beds by at passing more yeah. and more community policies. And yeah. it is, it becomes this myth of criminality. Um, yeah. yeah. I could get into all things justice all day. But, well, um, and we could even like literally everything that, that you're saying, you know, is everything that we're teaching on this podcast about relational parenting is mm-hmm. that you are held you are you are held re- accountable um high to high standards as children right parents are holding their children to high standards um and expectations but there's also mm-hmm. a level of like empathy and understanding and child development and like what a child's actually capable of doing at a given age and um, how we respond to them teaches them how to respond to the world. So if you see sure. your like if you're punishing and shaming your child all the time and you see them reflecting that back to you by yelling at you, talking back to you, screaming at you, disagreeing with you, rebelling against you, like mm-hmm. you need to look in the mirror. Like that like mm-hmm. what you're doing is what they're going to do back to you. And so um it's similar. Like we teach our kids how to repair. We, by showing them when Mm -hmm. we mess up, we are going to repair with you. We're going to apologize. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about, you know, what I did and and what I could have done better um, and how I could have responded to you better and how I'm going to do it better next time. Um, And there's Mm -hmm. forgiveness and acceptance of like your humanness and the mistakes that you make. Right. Because I'd rather... Mm -hmm this child makes their mistakes here in the safety of childhood for the, for 18 years and has that place to learn and overcome and become an adult who can go out into the world and not make these huge life altering mistakes. But if they're just shamed and punished the whole time they're growing up, then they're not going to have any tools for going out into the world and not making those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's, there's just so many parallels yeah. One, has, one aspect um, I like about so, this is uh, it can heal uh, that. Patrice Colors wrote a book. Um, I'm forgetting what it's called all of a sudden, but it's basically talking about, oh, the abolitionist handbook. And so Patrice Colors wrote this, the abolitionist handbook, hmm. and it talks about bringing abolition into everyday practices. And so it's there's key examples of parenting um, with through an abolitionist lens. It's so much easier as a parent to, to be like, oh, you messed up, you go to the corner. You messed up, uh, you uh, go upstairs to your room. That's exactly yeah. what we do as a system. Baby um, jail. Well, the dunce jail camp. And prisons. Yeah. You messed up, you get you get kicked out of community for a little bit. Yeah. And the more uh what we've what we've come to know, that's the more um healing, reparative, and ultimately successful way is relational parenting and coming and you know talking to our, our children about, you know, the behaviors, what was the context of the, I'm really big on behavioral intervention and understanding the context mm-hmm. in which they chose different behaviors, right? Like my mm-hmm. son um, at school, he, he pushed a teacher. And so I was like, wow, like that, that's not, that's not him on an everyday basis. Like it would be really helpful for me to understand what was going on so I can talk mm-hmm. to him about it. 
And so when I talked to the teacher, she said, oh, he was having a really hard time doing his numbers and his letters and he wanted to get up and go play, but it wasn't playtime. And so um, Mm -hmm. that was the, the reason. And so when he was able, understanding that context, when he was able to get home, I talked to him about, you know, being mindful and sitting in a chair and doing his breathing exercises and, you know, using the tools that really help him stay calm and centered and focused so that he knows like, okay, the faster I get these numbers and letters done, the faster I can go play. Um, Yeah. And so that, that behavioral intervention becomes essential, but making sure that we are not like othering our kids and being like, you go over there, like you're the problem. And instead being like, you're not a problem. Your behaviors are just not what we would, they're not conducive to what we really want. And let's talk about them. Let's explore and let's get some new behaviors, some new tools, some new interventions that are going to help you actually get what you really want. You want to go play. You don't want to be in timeout. So it creates well, win-win. The, <laughs> the emotion behind, so the, the situation, like the, you know, explaining that he was, frustrate, you know, he was having a hard day, um, is really helpful. And then also asking, like asking him, cause there's always an emotion or a need behind a behavior. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not always just about like, we need to change this behavior, but we need to look at what emotion was he feeling and okay, what tools can we now, like you were talking about the breathing, like what tools can we give him to use instead of pushing a teacher to Mm -hmm. move that frustration out of his body. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. he's having an emotion, energy and motion um, in that moment. And, you know, sounds like, Hey, were you really frustrated that you couldn't go play? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, okay, here are some things that we can do to move that frustration out of your body instead of pushing a teacher, because that is not a socially acceptable behavior. You're causing harm. And and we don't do that in community. We don't cause harm to, to one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Dad, you were starting to say something a minute ago. What were you saying? Um, once upon a time, I knew a, uh, a uh, youth uh, probation officer, and yeah. she helped me rewrite. There was, a, there was an athletic code that I thought was pretty it's punitive, what you were talking about before. The athletic code was like, all you do these things, and all it did is punish and say, okay, you, you, know, you can't play in four games or something. There was no element of restitution to it, the, the restorative yeah. justice thing. And I, and I modified the existing athletic code, and everybody hated it. This was in small-town America, hmm. but... Getting past, getting people, a lot of people to go from a mindset of punishment is what we need to restoration, restitution, that kind of healing. Let's make the world a better place. I've found that can be a real hard sell in places, whereas it's very obviously going to create a better world. Yeah. You know, in the long term, people, a lot of people don't like to look at, yeah, this kid's causing trouble because he's from a bad home and they're not interested in fixing the bad home. They're just interested in being judgmental. So I'm the upshot is I'm looking at this Kentopia thing as that I think this has a real shot improving, improving Sorry. the. Uh, the living circumstances of kids and the parenting of the kids and stuff is a way to sneak in and make and make the world a better place that way, you know, till that's more common. I think coming in, coming in with a thing like Kentopia is a yeah. great idea towards alleviating that. And, of it, and it's going to take it's going to take years and years and years. But I think those are the kind of the real social evolution things that that, that, uh, that have an effect long term. So I always say it's not a great conversation mm. unless I cry. And do no. I cry at least once, <laughs> you know, and I always tell clients like, don't worry, I will likely cry when we were working together because I'm so inspired by like what you're doing, what we're working on. Um, but thank you for that reflection, Rick. I think that that is, and also thank you for the work that you did to, you know, lead this movement towards care, towards restorative justice, towards we are not going to incarcerate our way out of problems. We have to do better as a society. Yeah, we have yeah. to care enough about people to 
make a difference, make a change. And the more we try to shun people, the more we try to, you know, get them out of, you know, as long as I can't see it, it doesn't exist, is Mm -hmm. not a solution. We cannot incarcerate our way out of poverty. We cannot incarcerate our way out of the housing crisis. We cannot incarcerate our way out of problems, social problems. We have to care enough about people to see, okay, what actually works? What is the data showing us? What is research showing us? And time and time again, having programs that are care-based around education, mental health, talent development, um, And ultimately, like uh, Cornell West has this saying of um, justice, like you can know it's justice when it looks like love. I'm butchering the quote and I love his quote. Mm. So forgive Dr. West. Um, But the the close, I I don't have all the solutions, but I know the barometer I will use to judge or to um, say if we are closer to justice or not is does it look like love? And Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you, without a shadow of a doubt, having having done this work for 20 years, the closer the solutions look like love, the closer we are to a more just and humane and system of 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 care that will ultimately work, that will not cost a fortune and that will really help us collectively thrive. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> keep at it stay practical that's the hard part you yeah. know the the there's a lot of substance abuse people that uh, would benefit from substance abuse don't get uh, counseling don't get it because it's expensive there are a lot of things are being mm-hmm. are expensive and you exploring emily you exploring all of these ways to make these things happen you know without needing government input without needing to convince a bunch of people just it's a business, it's a whatever, it, uh, you know, self-sustaining, that I think that's the way it's going to work. I think you're on yeah. to something. I mean, I'm just super grateful to have incarnated at a time when we have the internet, when we have options like yeah. crowdfunding, the, the yeah. collective um, resources to make a vision like this possible. So I'm, yeah. I'm just forever grateful. Um, and I love the idea of, you know, I think it the this hybrid idea of it can both be a, you know, benefit corporation and it can be uh, have elements of a nonprofit. Um, and the mm-hmm. nonprofit for all of the programs for like the kids and programs for the adults living in the, in the home. Um, and I also deeply believe that. Um, share like not just shared communal living where everybody has this is at the same level like i i think um what's worked well really worked well what's worked really well here is having moms that are at different levels like i've had a mom that was Hmm. just um starting like different levels in our career different levels in our income and i deeply believe that all like all tides raise all boats like we can help each other get to like our best next level and that level of care and support and help there's so, um, a mom that I lived with that um, she ultimately moved out because she um, got in a relationship but there was a time when like she she was just like no no like I'm not giving up M like I'm not going to give up my mommy and so it really made mm. her part like she pulled out all the stops to be like, no, like we're going to get married. Like I'll make this worth your wild. Um, and so I also <laughs> think that it's, you know, Kentopia can also be like, you know, at some point with like families, like, you know, there yeah. are going to be like, it's nothing is ever perfect. Humans are messy. And so I don't yeah. exactly know how this will play out. I just have the infinite abundant trust in relational in social work, like relation, like in social work, you learn two things. One relationships are everything and two to trust the process. And so I'm just having this massive trust of, of this vision and this massive trust of, I know people well enough and skill people skills well enough to combat any, anything that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's what relationship skills give you is the ability to, to navigate anything, anything Mm -hmm. life has to throw at us. We can navigate through relationship, healthy relationship skills. Yeah. Mm 
That's the uh, that's the lone wolf dies, the pack survives. <laughs> the, the the diversity in the I always go to these horrible metaphors. Uh, the diversity, like sibling rivalry, having not having no two people in the group that are identical, they're not competing for the same niche. You know, sounds like a really good really good methodology that uh, so you don't get. You, you get you get more you get more diversity uh, amongst the people, more sharing of uh, skill sets. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, and it just okay. So I just thought of the quote as it should be. Uh, the Cornell West quote yeah. is "Justice is what love looks like in public," and so the more that we're oh. able to see these systems hmm. reflect love, the more that we're able to. And I deeply believe that, like. And after reading Adrienne Marie, Marie Brown's book, that, that as we're able to create fractals of them, it's proof yeah. points. Of like, okay, these fractals can, can then connect, and that's what creates the systems. And I, yeah. I'm in the grant work that I do, I create a lot of programs. Like it's it's doing program development and grant writing go hand in hand, and it's doing program development around like the innovation of if not prisons, then what? And why I started my business mm. was. Um, I wanted to be able to have something to point to, like, if not prisons, then look at these 30 amazing, brilliant clients that I had this year that are doing incredible work to end mass incarceration and create systems of care that are much more conducive to helping people never go back to a life that, you know, is harmful to them and community. Um, And it, 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 it's the best. (laughs) Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Good work. Making the world a better place. I love it. I love it. Um, you had me on here crying again, you know? Yeah. I always, I'm a crier too. I, uh, yes. Okay. I, this has been amazing. I don't, I always hate having to cut us off and end things. Uh-huh. Um, but we are, we're at our, over our hour. Um, hmm. But Emily, this has been absolutely beautiful. I think that mm-hmm. what you're doing is is absolutely world changing, um, especially for the population that you're serving that needs that needs these services, that needs this this community that's lacking in their lives. Because there are so many of us um, who who just don't have that community um, and who end up going it alone and um, Community is one of your, one of your values. It's one of mine. It's one of ours here at Relational Parenting. We talk about getting parents the support that they need, Um, parents deserving, you know, to have their cups filled, to share in community with one another uh, in order to show up as the best version of themselves, Um, you know, to eliminate the guilt and shame of parenting um, and to offer the skills to fill the cup, to, to be able to you know, create the family that they dream of. And so, um, I just so appreciate what you're doing and for you being here today to share it with, with our audience. Yes. Thank you so much for the time. And, you know, I think people talk about it, it takes a village to raise kids. Right. And so Kintopia is really insulating people and building that village, that village. And so I hope a lot of people will be inspired and will donate to the crowdfunding campaign and stay in touch all of their feedback ideas like you know businesses aren't built just one person so I also want to lean yeah. into community of folks that are of your listeners that are inspired by this please get, keep in touch yeah reach out um Emily will put all of your links in the show notes mm-hmm. um where they can find you where they can reach out for the crowdfunding campaign um where they could get in touch with you offer their ideas or ask questions as well um and yeah all Yay. right thank you well, jenny rick thank you. thank you all right happy parenting and good luck out there everybody well did you learn anything new or have you heard all of this before do you agree with us disagree with us have a question we want to see you in our inbox or via the patreon page in the show notes Tap on either link to send us your feedback, share your own parenting story, or support our mission of providing a connected community for all parents. 
And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you loved this episode, click on that little star and give us five of them so we can get visible to other parents who are looking for us. This is your weekly reminder. Parents, you already have everything you need inside of you. You are a strong, loving, capable parent. And here, you are never alone. I'll see you next week.